Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this class, BC 2 on 2, Christian Apologetics. Let's just pray and then we will get started. Father, we thank you so much for the beginning of a new academic year in college. And thank you for all of us who could come together in person, online, and those who will be looking listening to this on the e-learning. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to come together, study and learn and grow in the things of God. Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of wisdom. You are the true instructor, our real teacher. We pray that you will open our hearts and minds. Give us, Lord, revelation. Give us understanding and help us to learn these things and begin to use them, Lord, in our lives to serve you, to serve your people, and to see the extension of your kingdom here on earth. So we commit ourselves, we commit this journey we're going to make in this course. Lead us, establish truth in our hearts, strengthen each of us, and equip us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Welcome, everyone. So some basic uh, preliminaries. Everybody should have a copy of the course notes. Uh, those of you who don't have it here in classroom, I'll just uh, show that uh, you get your copy. Those of you online e-learning, uh, PDF copy has been made available for you uh, in the uh, coursework section. So you can download the PDF. and. Um, uh, use that to follow along in the class. Let me just go ahead and share the notes for those of you online, and uh, we will can go through the notes here. So, the purpose of this course, Christian apologetics and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that word apologetics uh, in a bit just to give us an idea so what we want to do is answer the questions that we may have ourselves as believers as well as people around us who questions that they have about the christian faith right about why we believe what we believe about the bible about things the bible teaches how do we answer these questions, right? And um, when we talk about Christian apologetics, today um, uh, in the Christian world, uh, people approach it in, from different ways. Some approach it with a very philosophical way. Uh, they approach it, uh, approach it with a, you know, um, more of a thinking about life, kind of approach. So that's called philosophical. Then there are those who approach it from a scientific perspective. So typically these would be scientists who try to answer these questions from a scientific evidence-based. See, we saw this, we found this. So based on actual evidence. So there are those who approach it from that perspective. And then there are those who approach it from a scriptural perspective and say, the Bible says chapter and verse. This is why you know they give a theological reason, explanation for these questions. And then there are those who would approach it purely from a uh, approach from a spiritual perspective. You know, there are these spiritual, see the miracles, see the healings, and so on. So you have these four different ways that people try to answer the questions that people are asking. Okay, philosophical, scientific. Uh, theological and spiritual. Um, what we are going to do is we're going to basically combine all of these. So in this course, uh, some of the responses may be philosophical, a combination of philosophical, scientific, theological, you know, it'll be, we'll combine this, right? Um, and so we are not going to just take one approach, only philosophical, no, no, we'll combine, we'll, we'll com combine these things in response to questions. And um, uh, of course, uh, if you want to pursue further, you know, I can show, we can say, okay, yeah, there's more that you can read in this uh, area, scientific or 
philosophical. You can read more. But our, our, our attempt, our goal will be to blend these things, bring it all together. Right? Some of the things that we will be addressing in this course, um, first of all, we'll start off by uh, explaining what is apologetics and uh, how, what, how, what is a biblical way to go about this. Right? So we call it biblical ap apologetics. Then we'll start off with basic questions like existence of God, right? So uh, uh, how do we, you know, how do we know there is a God? God exists. We talk about creation. How do we know things were created, as opposed to other views? Um, then we talk about science and faith. You know, uh, is science opposed to faith? You know, and, and how can we bring these two together as people who believe in God but also uh, work with science. We'll talk about some theories, how our response to theory. So there is the evolutionary theory. So Darwin was, uh, you know, one of the well-known, you know, proponents of evolution. How do we respond to evolutionary theory? We'll also uh, talk about cosmology, the Big Bang theory, which means cosmology is how did this universe begin? And uh, Big Bang is one of the theories that tries to explain, oh, this is how the universe began, right? So Darwin, or the evolutionary uh, theory, says this is how life began on Earth. Cosmology is how did this universe come into existence, right? So uh, we will respond to those, those, those theories. Uh, then we will get into talking about the Bible itself. How do we know the Bible is true? How did the Bible come to us? And how do we know the scriptures are true, genuine? People say, oh, so you, just, you just believe this Bible. <laughs> Where did it come from? You know, did it fall from heaven or something? You know, you know, why, you, why do you believe this so much? Of course, you know, we can give some valid reasons why we believe in the authenticity and the accuracy of the scriptures. Um, the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Why do you say Jesus is the only way? Why can't you say Jesus is one of the many ways? Well, so the uniqueness of Jesus. Right? Then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How can you say right? you were not there 2,000 years ago? <laughs> Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. You were not there on that day in Jerusalem. Here we are 2,000 years later. We're saying Jesus rose from the dead. How, how can you be so convinced? Okay? So we have to respond to that. Then uh, salvation in Jesus Christ. Uh, then extending this to how do you share Christ with a Hindu? Uh, I'm still on page one, you know, the, the introduction here. Uh, course overview. Uh, how do you share Christ with a Hindu? How do you share Christ with a Muslim? We're not going to go into full depth, but enough to have a conversation. So that if you keep this thing in your mind, you know, okay, when I speak to a Hindu, I must point out these things. I speak to a Muslim must point out these things. So you know, this is what the main differences are when we present the gospel. Then we'll talk about social challenges, a lot of questions, social in society, a lot of questions, all kinds of issues. What does the Bible say about these things? Uh, then a big question is about suffering. Now, why is there evil and suffering in the world today? Say so God is a good God. Say so God is all powerful. God is on the throne. But then so much of evil, so much of suffering. Innocent people are suffering. How can you, how do we answer that question? You know, why is there suffering? How do we understand suffering? Right? Look at that. And then uh, in the end, uh, if we have some time, uh, we'll try to ad uh, address some common questions. So there's 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 a lot of ground we have to cover uh, in the semester on uh, apologetics. So we will try to do our best in this. And and as we go through the course, uh, feel free to ask questions anytime. Okay. So keep it open. You know, this is the whole point of this course: ask questions. <laughs> so ask your questions. Anything uh, as we go through these various topics, uh, we will try to answer them. Um, we will have uh, three assessments. I mean, basically, I'll give you one assessment, but it'll be broken into three parts, 30, 30, 30. 
<laughs> different covering different portions of this content uh it'll be easy you don't have to memorize anything it'll be an open book exam uh, so you don't have to worry about it all right um so that's what we're going to cover in the course let's get started and those of you online please feel free to write you know type your questions in the chat i will look at the chat from time to time and uh, um, we will go to you okay let me just pause here uh, online students you're able to um, I'll stop presenting. You're able to see my, uh, I mean, you were able to see my PDF, audio, video, everything's okay. Any questions? All good? Okay. So if you have any questions, just type it in the chat. Every, every now and then I'll pause, I'll come back and look at it and uh, take time to respond to your questions. Okay. So let's uh, move forward now with our course content. Let's get started. All right, so let's go to lesson number one, Biblical Apologetics. And um, we want to explain the meaning of the word. And also, I want us to understand a biblical perspective to this whole area. All right, that's uh, what I want us to understand. So the word apologia, this is the Greek word. So the, the English word apologetics uh, comes from the Greek word apologia which we find many times in the New Testament. And I have, uh, uh, you know, I've uh, pointed out a few of these uh, references. Let's look at them quickly, please, if you go with me in your Bible. Um, we'll go to Acts 22 and verse 1. Uh, just look at the places where this word apologia is used so that we try to get a, 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 an understanding of the meaning of this word. And uh, I want to highlight something here, uh, you know, from a biblical perspective. So Acts 22, verse 1, uh, Paul is speaking. He says, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. Or hear my apologia before you. So, sorry? PDF is not visible. Huh? PDF is not visible. Oh dear, stop sharing. Oh, yeah. um, you're not able to see my PDF. Oh, it was showing the classroom. Share the entire screen. Okay. How about now? Yeah. PDF. Now it's come. Okay. All right. Sorry uh, I'm, I'm, if uh, I didn't show this to you earlier. So basically, uh, just before this, I went through the course overview. I just kind of introduced this uh, and went through the outline, what we're going to cover. We'll have three assessments. That's what we will do. And now we are starting off lesson number one. Right? So let's look at these uh, scriptures uh, where the word apology is being used. And just to get an idea of uh, the meaning of that word. Acts 22, 1, Paul says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you. So Paul uh, actually has been, at this point, he's been arrested uh, uh, for the preaching of the gospel. He's been questioned, why are you doing this? And he's saying, I want you to listen to my defense. Right? So the word apologia is translated defense. I'm defending something. I'm defending something I'm standing for. I'm defending something I believe in. So apologia, you're defending something that you're standing for, believing in. Acts 25, verse 16. Here, Paul is before King Agrippa. He's been brought before king. He's, you know, he had a, uh, he's again now being tried for what he's preaching the gospel. 
and Acts 25 verse 16 was it verse 16 yeah so here it's he is explaining to King Ag Agrippa he says to them I answered it is not the custom of the Romans to del deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him right to answer for himself actually is one word apologia yeah so apologia to answer for himself yeah so he's being questioned he's answering that is apologia you're giving an answer yeah for what you stand for for what you believe right so it's used like that in that sense um another interesting one, uh, 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 look is in second corinthians i'm just skipping some verses here let's go to second corinthians chapter 7 verse 11 second corinthians chapter 7 verse 11 and here that same word apologia is used to clearing yourself clearing off yourself so for observe this very thing that you saw it in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what women desire, what zeal, what vindication, vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So basically, you know, the Corinthians were being corrected. And uh, when Paul, you know, addressed them, they responded. And they, it was them saying, okay, okay, I accept. And this is our, you know, their response to whatever charges that were brought to them. Okay, it was a clearing of yourselves. You're responding to the charges being brought. Um, and let's go to First Peter 3.15. Now, this is the classic scripture uh, that is used all the time. First Peter 3, verse 15 to explain what the word what apologetics is all about so first peter chapter 3 verse 15 right so whenever you know uh somebody is talking about apologetics uh, almost all the time they will come to this passage first peter chapter 3 verse 15 um, peter says but sanctify the lord god in your hearts that is, set the Lord God apart in your heart, hold him with reverence, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So this is a very beautiful scripture. It kind of gives us a definition, the meaning of apologia. What is it? Give a defense. To everyone who asks you for a reason. Why? Yeah? They ask you for a reason why you have this hope in you. But do it with meekness and fear. Meekness, do it humbly. Do it with meekness and reverence. So fear means respect. Do it humbly. Do it respectfully. But give a defense. Give an explanation. For the reason, for the hope you have right, when somebody asks you. Right? So it's a very classic, a very good definition. It's to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason why you have this hope, why you believe, why you know there is a God, why you uh, have joy even in tribulation, why you are so hopeful. So many questions people ask. So you're giving a defense. That is apology here but do it with do it humbly do it respectfully yeah so we're not doing it with the intent to fight <laughs> we're not doing it with the intent to argue or even to prove that we know everything because we don't know everything we don't know everything but we have this hope uh somehow we are convinced i can only share what I know and I do it humbly and I do it respectfully 
That's all. That's all the Bible is saying. Do it humbly. Do it, do it res respectfully. All right. So you can, you know, you can look at um, uh, the word. Now, interestingly, apologia is used both in the context of when you are speaking to a group or when you're speaking one on one. It's the same thing. You know. So when we say apologetics, don't think, oh, I have to stand in front of hundreds, thousands of people and give a big lecture. No. Even if you're explaining to one person, that is apologia. You are, you know, you are giving a defense or you are explaining yourself. You're answering a question. You're doing apologetics, you know, technically. That's what you're doing. Right? So it's used in both contexts. So if you want to put it in some sentences here, I just, uh, you know, it'd be explaining with reason what we believe. We point to evidence for what we believe. We respond to ideas. Now, of course, you know, uh, people will ask, was Jesus an apologist? Huh? Well, I think, yeah, he answered questions. He was not afraid to take the questions of the people. People came to him with questions. And he was not afraid. Yeah, you ask, what, what is your question? You ask. And he took the questions. Sometimes he knew people were asking questions just to get him in trouble. The, the question was not genuine. They were only asking the question to trap him. Even he listened to those questions and then with the wisdom of God, he asked them back a question. Yeah. So they tried to trap him, but he gave, he usually gave, he said, okay, you answer this question, we'll see. <laughs> but when people came with genuine questions, he took it. He answered, he responded, and he was not averse to answering the questions of the people. So we can say that, you know, the Lord Jesus uh, was the greatest apologist. He was a very simple man, meaning he grew up as a carpenter, but he took the questions of everyone, lawyers, scribes, Pharisees, all simple people. He took everybody's questions. He answered those questions. Right? So he spent time. Even his own disciples would come and say, Lord, you gave that parable we did not understand. Can you please explain it to us? And then privately he would say, okay, this is what the meaning of the parable is. This is what it is. So he took time to explain things. Right? Um, he, uh, in John 7, uh, you know, when, when, when Jesus was speaking, it says that, uh, you know, they were amazed at his words. You know, the officers had sent some people to say, hey, go catch him. They came, they were listening to him speaking. They're amazed at his words. So we can't, we've never heard a man speak like this man. Never heard a man speak like this man. And they went away. They didn't, they didn't catch Jesus. They were sent to catch him, but when they came and heard, listened to him speaking, they said, we've never heard somebody speak like this. But, right? um, when uh, he explained the mysteries of the kingdom, as I mentioned, when people tried to trap him uh, with, with words, they couldn't. You remember the time when... Uh, 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 the, the 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 Pharisees and other I forget exactly which group it came. They said, "Okay, we have a question. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not?" So that was a trick question, because if he said yes, then they say, "Ah, oh, you are a Roman agent. <laughs> You're an agent from the Roman Empire. <laughs> they have sent you here. You're telling us to give money to the Romans." If he said no, they'll call the Roman soldiers. Come, come, come. This man is telling us not to pay tax. Either way, he's going to get into trouble. So it's a trick question. You can't say yes, you can't say no. What is this? He said, you bring me a coin. They brought him a coin. He says, well, whose picture you're seeing here? Caesar. 
Then he says, you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, you give to God what belongs to God. Finished. So even when people came asking questions with the wrong intent, you know, trying to trap him, they uh, are like, he, 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 he was so, you know, intelligent in the defense and the response, they couldn't hold him. You know, so uh, you find Jesus dealing with, with these things. And of course, there are people who came with him, came to him with genuine questions. He said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, uh, Nicodemus came in the night. You know, he didn't want anybody to see him because he was him. He himself was a very educated man, a scholar. So he came in the night. He said, Jesus, I have some questions. You know, I know you're a teacher come from God. Nobody can do these things uh, except God is with him. And then Jesus begins to talk to him. Say, see, you need to be born again. And then Nicodemus doesn't understand. You know, what does it mean to be born again? Jesus explains. So he welcomed people uh, who came to him with questions. But what I want to point out is this, that Matthew 13, 54, Jesus not only demonstrated wisdom, but he also did mighty works. So even in the ministry of Jesus, he didn't depend exclusively on his preaching and teaching and the wisdom. It was there. People saw it. Nobody could trap him. So there was a wisdom of God. True. But he didn't just depend on that. He combined that with mighty works. So when people looked at his whole ministry, so let's go to Matthew 13 and verse 54. So when people looked at his whole ministry, that was their comment. That means they observed both. You know, not just part of it. They said, you know, where it's Matthew 13, 54, when he had come to his own country, he taught them in the synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? So there was both wisdom and mighty works. Both. Okay. So Jesus just didn't depend on wisdom. That was part of it. But he also demonstrated mighty works. Now, I want to just expand on this thought that true apologetics or biblical, I should say, biblical apologetics is like this. It is a combination of wisdom and mighty works. That is biblical apologetics. I mean, it's you answer the questions, you explain the mysteries of the kingdom, you respond to the questions of the people, that is wisdom, but you also have mighty works. That is biblical defense. So I want you to think about this with me. When we look at the apostle Peter, We know that Peter actually was a very simple man. Very simple man. He was actually a fisherman. He was not this, a scribe or a highly educated scholar. He was a fisherman. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, the verse which we just read, 1 Peter 3.15, where Peter is saying, give a defense, First Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. When Peter says, Give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason. Think about this. Peter was a very simple man. 
So he's not, I don't think, just going by that. I don't think he's thinking about give some big scientific explanation to everybody who we'll come and ask you for it. He's a simple man. He's a fisherman. But who, whom the Lord called to be an apostle. So when he says, give a defense, give an apology, I don't think in his mind he's thinking, oh, think of something very complicated to tell people. And they ask you, why you have this hope in you? No. Basically, he says, hey, just explain. Just tell them. And if you look at Peter's own ministry, his in his ministry, his biggest defense was the demonstration of power. So if you go to Acts chapter 4, Acts 4, 13 and 14, the bottom of that page, Acts 4, 13 and 14, bottom of page 4, Acts 4, 13 and 14, you see, what do we observe? Early in the early on, early on in the ministry of G, uh, Peter, it says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. So think about Peter's apologia in this situation. What was his defense? It says here, Peter and John, they were uneducated men, untrained men. But these people, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they could not say anything against their preaching. Why? Because they had seen a man who had been healed. They'd seen a man who had been can't say anything. Peter and John, uneducated, untrained. No big argument, no big, you know, scientific defense, nothing. But they had with them a man who had been healed. And that was their defense. Okay. So the point again is that. We must combine, we must combine our defense, our explanation, our preaching, our teaching with the demonstration of the word of God. So you think about it. What was Peter's apology? His apology always about making an argument, a well thought out response. Or in some situations, just the healing, just the miracle itself becomes our defense. You're getting it? Sometimes we don't have to say anything. Okay? This person has been healed. This prayer has been answered. This situation has been changed. That itself becomes a defense. Apologia. That's what happened in this case. Now, you find the same thing in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul is different from Peter. Peter and John were untrained men. Yeah, they, they were just fishermen. But Paul came from the other side. He graduated from Harvard. He had a PhD. <laughs> he had a PhD, very educated man. You know, he studied under Gamaliel. Uh, so he, you know, he was, okay, he's got all these degrees. He has all these very scholarly men. And of course, he could reason. He could uh, present his argument, fine. But we see even in his ministry that he depended on the power of God. Right? So he didn't go just with the wisdom, like we saw in the ministry of Jesus. He didn't go just with wisdom. He reasoned, but he also demonstrated. And so you'll find, and I've listed many scriptures here from the book of Acts. Um, 
where you'll find that, and we will look at a few of them, where you'll find that Paul in his ministry, he reasoned with people. That means he gave a good explanation. He had his arguments uh, that he presented, but he also demonstrated the power of God. Okay, so look at some uh, the use of the word. Now we read Acts 22 1. Brethren, fathers, hear my defense, or hear my apology before you. He does his defense before Festus and so on, to the point where they say, You are mad. But let's look at this example. Let's go to Acts 13. Acts 13. And let's read verses 6 to 12. Acts 13, verses 6 to 12. Let's see what happens here. So this is on their first missionary journey. They just started. Paul and Barnabas have just started going out from Antioch. And um, they're going on their first missionary journey. And they come to the, uh, the island of Paphos. And there, there is the governor of the islands. Uh, verse 7 says his name was Sergius Paulus. Uh, he was a very intelligent man. And uh, he wanted to listen to what Barnabas and Saul had to say. So just think about this. In Acts 13, verse 7, this man, the governor, is an intelligent man. So there are times so there, you know, we, we have to bring the gospel to thinking people. Right? So they're thinking. They're intelligent people. They, they may be very highly educated. They're, having, they're in a high position, like this man, Sergius Paulus. He's the governor of this island. Obviously, very highly educated, very, very wealthy, very you know, accomplished in the world. But he's interested in spiritual things. So we should not think that Highly educated people, wealthy people are not interested in spiritual things. No. There are people who are highly educated, who may be very wealthy, high positions, but they are also interested in spiritual things like this man. Sadly, this man, Sergius Paulus, at, before Paul and Barnabas came, he was being controlled by a sorcerer, by somebody who was practicing witchcraft. So he was interested in spiritual things, but the wrong kind of person was influencing him. A person who was practicing witchcraft was influencing this very, you know, you could say very intelligent, very powerful, very influential, very wealthy man. And we would see those kinds of things happening in our world today as well, right? There are people who, by, for wrong reasons, they have gone, they started dabbling in their cult, they started dabbling in witchcraft, this, that. And they are, they are very influential, educated, but because of the interest in spiritual things, they're actually being controlled by the wrong influence. And into such situation, Paul and Barnabas, there they come. How do they handle this? Verse um, 7, we'll read from verse 7. So it says here, uh, who was, it's talking about this man, a sorcerer who was with um, uh, Sergius Paulus. Uh, this man called for Barnabas and, Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. We're saying, but Elimas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So this sorcerer, He's opposing Paul and Barnabas. And he's trying to keep this man from opening up to the faith. So there is a clash here. Not easy now. This man is interested. He said, please come and talk to me. Oh, whatever you have to say. He's interested in spiritual things. He's interested in what Paul and Barnabas has to say. But there is an opposing force now. A man who's practicing witchcraft is opposing them. What happens? Verse 9. Then Saul, 
who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil. <laughs> Don't go and call people like that. <laughs> you enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. When he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching, Teaching of the Lord. So Paul, of course, anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now he didn't go and do this to everybody. Right? What we can say is at that moment, in that situation, this was how God wanted to work. The Holy Spirit moved on Saul, later became Paul, and moved in this manner. So that Paul and that man Jesus just said, hey, you will be blind for a season. And something happened, it was blind. Something supernatural happened. You know, God did a supernatural work through Paul. So what happened to this governor? It says in verse 12, he believed because of two things. He saw what God did. And he also heard the teaching of the Lord. So both happened. So here's a beautiful example where um, there was both the teaching of the Lord and there was a demonstration of the power of God. Both happened. And this very intelligent man who was being influenced by a sorcerer, he believed in Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful example. Right? So... Let's pause here. We will look at maybe a couple of more examples. And then all these scriptures here from the book of Acts, you know, I would encourage you to read them later on, uh, which tell us that Paul, in his ministry, he combined both. He combined both, right? We will look maybe at one more passage after the break. Let me just see if there are any questions from those online. Any questions from those online? You've been following following along so far? Any questions? Okay. All right, so we'll take a break. We'll be back in 10 minutes, and we will continue. Thank you. <laughs> 